Hello everybody, my name is Nino and herewith I shall begin a series of videos regarding artificial intelligence. The first two, this and the next one, are going to relate to more philosophical topics. Then there shall come a few videos of more theoretical nature where you understand the principles of what I'm showing you. And finally, there will be some one and a half or two dozen of um, experiments which you can actually run. Let me state that clearly from the beginning. I am not going to tell you what some sort of experts are saying or some sort of inspirational quotes from the internet or cuteness here or little kids in national costumes there. I don't care about any of this. I want to show you actually working approaches to artificial intelligence on which I have been pretty much working back well maybe the last 20 years since I was a kid in fact so this first video is going to relate to conclusions from my essay on that which cannot be thought and the aim of it is a more civilized discussion so that later on I'm basically not regretting to have shown you anything at all in the first place. I want a civilized discussion and I want to make clear what thinking really is about and in particular what is the nature of proof. I want a clean philosophical and logical approach away from burden of proof arguments anthropocentrism, atheism, or theism, inspirational quotes, transhumanism, psychology, and all that other waste of time quite popular um, on the internet once you try to lead a civilized discussion. I'm trusting that we shall have much fun together. Let's look at the nature of proving things. Well, in essence, you are having three possibilities to prove something, of which two don't work and only the last one is a real proof. But let's begin with the first. You're proving V due to W, that due to X, that due to Y, that due to Z, and so on ad infinitum. And in the end, you have no proof whatsoever. You were just basing one consideration on another, but you had no idea where it all stems from. A variation of pointlessness is circular reasoning, where you're saying that a thing is due to another, that's due to x, that's due to y, that's due to z, but z is again due to x. Then somewhere here you lost it. Somewhere here there was a sort of proof, sort of decomposition of terms, call it whatever, but you did not proceed with it, so you're proving nothing. What proof really means, means the reduction of sentences to a to an axiom maybe one or several axioms of your reasoning system so you're saying v due to w w due to x x due to y y due to z but z is only due to itself and z in that sense is an absolute truth Z is chosen as the basis of your reasoning and you hence do not prove Z. You cannot prove Z, in fact, from your reasoning system for which Z has been chosen. If you believe you can, you will end up quickly in one of your two upper options which lead to nowhere. So when you're talking about proving something, you are really talking about this approach where you reduce questions to some final principles and that's utterly important and I can't repeat it uh, enough to you cannot question or change an axiom from within a given system if you believe you can do this then only from a less specific and more general logical system which itself will be subject to axioms. And there is no burden of proof at all for this. It is just a purely logical consideration. 
So for instance, if you say in Euclidean geometry, the world is flat, then it simply is flat. There is no way you can address the issues of the world from the geometry itself. And the root of minus one has no solution within the set of rational numbers. It does have a solution, namely i, in the set of complex numbers. However, that's a higher system than rational numbers. And the world is flat might not be true if you look at a sphere, because evidently a sphere has different properties than a flat area. In particular, two parallel lines very well meet um, in a very finite space on a sphere. Like possibly, like just think of meeting at the poles. But these are different reasoning systems. In your original reasoning system, you stick to the chosen axioms. Now that is very important for discussions. You can only lead any meaningful discussion with anybody at all if you can agree on your foundation of reasoning. If two people say Z is the foundation, you can from there deduce Y, X, W and V. But if these people do not agree and one says no, the basis of things is Z, and the other one says, no, the basis of things is Omega, then they cannot discuss anything, because they cannot reduce any sentence to a common principle. They don't agree on the common principle, and hence a discussion between these people is impossible. You can only discuss and thereby jointly explore truth if you agree on the axioms. In practice, for discussions, in particular on the internet, but also in any other sphere of life, that means people shift around their axioms like moving sands just in order to be right. They are very popular, it is um, that they are telling you what I meant is something else and you just misunderstood me and so on. They in fact don't want to reach any sort of truth. They just want to be right or to feel as having been right. You may give them or deny them this emotional gratification, and you think you choose, but you will not reach any truth in discussions with them. In the same category fall the emotional arguments. But how can you say that? But that is so evil, but I don't feel well about it, I don't care. The point is, they don't want to reach truth at all, they only seek to feel well in general. Discussions with such people are utterly pointless and you can't really call that approach intelligent. You cannot reach any truth nor explore anything with them. I really recommend you to stay away from discussions with such people though admittedly they are more sincere than the first group because they are at least sincere that they are only going to tell you some sort of feel-good nonsense. And then there is a third group which is immediately declaring their opinion as correct and as an axiom. They are saying it is so because I say that. Now I must admit that that is correct, that is a valid approach. Just, you know, you can't explore any truth if the other person simply declares the point of view as an absolute truth a priori, then there's no further exploration of that. So you can say that that approach is correct, but pointless. Now, understand that true is not what is emotionally convenient, but strictly what follows from axioms. Let us look briefly at an example. Let's have two axioms in our logical system. Eutimios is a dog and dogs bite. From this you can conclude that Eutimios bites. That is true. What you cannot conclude is that Aurora is a woman. Aurora may very well be a woman, but it cannot be concluded from these axioms. Hence, in our reasoning system, that is false. If you look at the higher reasoning system, 
then it might be correct. But looking at just these two axioms, that's not sufficient. I'll have to put you on pause for a second. So I'm back. Yeah, so true is only what follows from the axioms and nothing else. That directly leads us to a very interesting concept, which is called the incompleteness theorem. You might be interested in the works of Gödel and Tarski um, about this topic. And its most basic idea is actually as simple as it is genius. Um, you say a system can be either complete or correct. So either the full circle or this wide section, but not both at the same time, if it follows from some certain axioms. You can say that Julius Caesar was a man and that that follows from your axioms. Hence, you may say that is true. But if your axioms do not define that Cleopatra was a woman, then that may be said as having been wrong. And it is just as right or as wrong as Cleopatra was a tomato. If it doesn't follow from your axioms, then it is not true according to the principles of your system. You may say that these axioms should be questioned and maybe you should choose different axioms. Well, you can do that, but you can do it only from a more abstract, so to say, from a higher reasoning system. Then it may turn out that that what you initially thought are the axioms are in fact just conclusions of a, of a set of higher axioms. So you say that some greater abstraction might help you to reconsider your axioms, but you don't avoid axioms that way altogether. You simply shift them to another level. You look at higher axioms, though still you do look at axioms. Now, the obviously, uh, obviously, this leads to two questions. Which reasoning system is the most specific one? As well as which reasoning system is most abstract? What are the limits of these systems, so to say? Well, the most specific one is rather funny. It's just a term because of itself, like potato because of potato or banana because of banana. Such a most basic reasoning system only consists out of a single term and that single term is at once its own axiom. You don't reason really at all with this sort of most primitive system and you realize it may be true but it is quite pointless, it doesn't really help you intuitively. Still, this is the one case. The other case, well, let us approach it gradually. What happens when you turn to the more abstract? Well, then you can say that the true part also increases. And the true part of your reasoning system now contains many possible truths. And such truths can be reasoning systems of their own. For instance, you may say that more abstract than complex numbers are numbers in general. They contain complex numbers, but they contain also lots of other sorts of numbers. You can go even further up, but the more, the more up you go, the more things are possible, but the less things are specifically true. Like you can make some certain predictions from complex numbers, and they will be more specific than predictions from numbers in general. So what happens if you go further up and further up, where truths become less and less specific and more and more is following from your more and more abstract axioms? Then you arrive in chaos. That is the topmost level, where everything is possibly true. Every axiom is imaginable. Really, you can set up any system, anything you wish. Everything is true, each structure and all structures, all at once and individually. 
Yes, that is contradictory to you, but it is not contradictory from the point of view of most abstract chaos. Understand that any system you define de depends only on its axioms. And chaos says you can really choose anything as an axiom. Every axiom is in fact as good as each other one. But that also means that you cannot determine axioms by reason. You can in fact say that they do determine reason as every sentence is going to be finally reduced to them as principles. But they themselves are not determined by reason. Chaos doesn't tell you which axioms to pick. I can only say, as terrible as it is, axioms are determined by intuition, not by reason. Now that's something to keep in mind when you are looking at various things which are oftentimes asserted as being on the basis of everything. They are just chosen as axioms. For instance, love is beautiful. Well, you may say that and from there you may follow with more or rather less funny romantic comedies. But you might as well say that love is terrible or awful or painful or any other negative attribute you can give to it. The same goes with the burden of proof. Or well, there is no objective burden of proof. It just works nicely for what you are commonly referring to as the scientific method. But you know, recently I had a funny discussion where it was shown how pointless the burden of proof might be. It was said, philosophers are in a dark room and they are looking for a cat. And the scientists, if they are in the same situation, they would use a flashlight. Oh, that's lovely, but what the scientists would really do is they would use a flashlight, they would not see the cat, and from there they would declare that there are no cats in general and that there is nothing outside the room anyway. And everybody who wishes to contradict them shall prove it. Therein you see the limitations of the burden of proof for purely logical considerations. It means really nothing. The other commonly used kind of truth is the social truth, like life is valuable. I believe that all of society, including myself, agree on that. But we agree by intuition. Certainly there were those who were thinking differently and they may be very well not alive anymore. But that's just a social truth. It is established by some sort of violent evolution. Those who think their life is not valuable have disappeared over the course of the centuries. But it is nothing abstract. It is true because you want it to be true. It is not somehow true in and of itself. And now more practically for the future videos, the same applies for the definition of artificial intelligence. There are many possible points of view on that. I have one. You may agree with it or not. And if we don't find an agreement, you understand we are there where the discussion began. If no agreement can be reached on the axioms, no discussion is possible. But all in all, you can say truth is defined by intuition and explored by reason. So the main point of this all is mind your axioms and people often fail to acknowledge the basis of their reasoning like they start to be like I truly meant that and I wanted to say that or they are like telling it's an absolute truth it is so and anything else is nonsense that does not really lead to a discussion if you wish to elucidate some idea by conversing with someone else you should agree what you regard as given a priori and from there be able to make conclusions. You may not agree to that upfront, but when you see that somebody is starting to play the definition game of oh no I truly meant something else, you might reconsider whether this whole so-called discussion is not truly just a waste of your time. So let me tell you now a few last words regarding tolerance. Many people will tell you, yeah, but I mean that and you say this, so 
In fact, we can say both are true and we cannot decide. There is a fundamental conflict between truth and tolerance. And I say there is no tolerance in the first place. No truth system somehow tolerates a different truth system, unless it is formed by its conclusions. Therefore, when two people are arguing about things and saying, you know, this might be true and that might be true, they are solving nothing unless they look at a more abstract system in which both of these subsystems, so to say, may follow from the axioms. So, there is no tolerance, there's just more abstract truth. For instance, if you're looking at religions, you may say, well, there is Buddhism and Christianity and Islam and whatever else you're having there. But you may say that the principles of them all to lead a good life, to be kind to others, and all these basically positive principles are common to them. And while each of them contradicts to each other and says, this is an absolute truth. Christianity, for instance, says, that's it, you know, there was Jesus and so on. Then still you may find agreement on this more abstract level where you're saying you know but we still want that people lead a good life and behave kindly to others something like that these are higher axioms and tolerance can only exist as long as those axioms are being followed the same is true about politics you say yeah there is a right-wing faction and the left-wing faction and they're not both right each of them is going to very fiercely declare the other one as wrong. But you may say that both of them try to lead a country in a most useful way. So recognize in, in what you will agree when you are realizing that the matter strikes the area of tolerance. For it is pointless to lead a discussion only to reach the conclusion that you might be right and the other one might be right and you actually don't know what you are talking about. Well, that's about it for this first video. I thank you very much for watching. And you shall find my essay as lot, uh, along with all other kinds of materials on my website on sites.google.com slash site slash logical triangulation. It's going to be a logical system, which I will present to you in the future. Thank you once again for watching. I hope to see you soon again here and goodbye for now.